Okay. Um, so yeah, particle physics, for example, uh, evaluation of a, of a particle accelerator uh, sensor data, and up to the largest scales, for example, simulation of galaxies, and you have use of machine learning in all these fields, from the very pure, like in helping to solve differential equations in mathematics, to very applied engineering. So today, as well, here, this workshop is on materials, right? So we are in the middle row here, uh, physics, chemistry, material science, everything on the scale of atoms, basically. And uh, let me, since this is a different talk, let me skip that slide. Here, um, so what, what is machine learning, right? And how do you define machine learning? And there, it, it's difficult, of course, right? It's a big field. Um, here are two definitions, one by Tom Mitchell in his uh, 97 book. He says, in a bit more words, algorithms whose performance improves with data are machine learning algorithms. I like this definition because it captures the learning effect, right? If you think about points in a plane and you fit a line through them, well, the more points you have, the better your line fit will be, right? Learning from data, from experience. Now, um, another definition by Samuelson, and you see it's from 1959, so quite a while ago, is that machine learning is about algorithms that solve problems without having explicit task specific solutions. So that means instead of provide, for example, uh, instead of providing an algorithm to find the shortest path in the graph explicitly, you say, look, these are graphs, these are examples of shortest paths in the graph. Now figure out what characterizes them. Huh? Um, so no specific problem specific algorithms. Okay, now in a bit more abstract way, machine learning is about the systematic identification of regularity or correlations in data. So finding correlations uh, in, in data sets, I'm oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, and at this point, yeah, it's used, oh yeah, and right, and one more, uh, but it's used, machine learning is often used to predict something, to analyze data or to control a system. So now at this point, at this abstract level already, right, there should be some questions like, Okay, but what are the errors that these methods make, right? Do we have error bars or not? And are these models interpretable? Do we know why a prediction was made, right? Can we trust these predictions? How reliable are those? And these are good and important questions. And here's just one example. Um, so this is, a, yeah, it's a well-known example. Um, this is from an image classification neural network. So the network was trained on a database of uh, images. And it was trained, these were classified according to what they showed. For example, this image shows a horse. And the, the neural network had to predict uh, the, the appropriate uh, class um, for, for new images. And now researchers analyzed this. It was performing very well. And researchers then analyzed how the network made its decision. So they wanted to know uh, which features is the network using? Is it looking for like edges maybe, or certain colors or combinations of shapes and colors? And when they analyzed the network, they found out that the network indeed found a very good correlation. And it turned out that all the, or most of the horse images in that database had this copyright notice at the bottom here. So what the neural network did is it realized if this copyright notice is there, it, the image is showing a horse. So the network did exactly what it was told to do. Right? It identified horses based on a correlation in the data, but this it did it in a way that was very different from what it was expected to do. Right? And this is, I think, an important lesson when you use machine learning in your work. Um, right? Try to make sure that the network is really doing what you want it to do and for the right reasons. But there are countless other examples like this. And it, it, it's clear they have to be because if you ask a machine to, to do a task, but you don't tell it how to do it, you're bound for surprises, like this one. Okay, that was the, my general, <laughs> uh, very brief introduction to machine learning uh, and the caveat that goes with it. Now, I want to very briefly uh, show some of our work and then we'll go to the kernel learning. Um, here, so we are interested in the exploration of large molecular and material spaces on the right hand side of the column. But we want, as a, I think it is clear that materials and molecular spaces grow combinatorially, right? If you think of molecules as labeled graphs and you count the number of possible 
labeled graphs, then you see that this grows extremely quickly. And for materials, it's the same thing. Uh, so, and to be able to explore such spaces and find materials with certain desirable properties or optimize existing ones, if you have a good starting point, then uh, you need the ability to predict properties of materials, like stability in the previous talk. And that's the middle column. So we are interested in the more midterm, inaccurate and precise property predictions for materials. Uh, this is a molecule, but same for materials. And that requires, at least for the properties we're interested in, to the ability, I will show an example on the next slides, the ability to run long dynamic simulations for large supercells. Now we want to be able to simulate large atomistic systems over long time scales. And this is possible with classical force fields, but unfortunately, you either have to parameterize the force field for a specific system to get reasonable accuracy, which is, can be quite difficult and, and tricky. Um, yeah, or you don't have the necessary accuracy. And maybe the force fields are even then, if you parameterize them as well as you can, they can still be not flexible enough. So you have either one of these difficulties or all of them combined. So what we want to do is we want to use machine learning to construct so-called machine learning potentials that given the position of the atoms, but not the electrons, just the atoms, uh, predict the forces acting on them and predict the energy and the negative gradient gives you the forces. So these are machine learning potentials. And yeah, let's be extremely brief here. Maybe you know some of these methods, right? The current workhorse method, Concham density functional theory, scales, let's say, roughly cubically, depending on which functional you use and what exactly you do. Um, oh, I, I do see, uh, okay, sure, please do ask questions. And I randomly saw a question. I don't see the chat, but one, one window popped up here. So what is accuracy? But in this context, when I say accuracy, I mean the error that in the energies and forces, for example, measured in the root mean, also against the mean absolute error, or the root mean squared error in whatever units you prefer, like electron volt, uh, for, for example, of the energy per atom or of the, uh, of the force um, and per angstrom. Uh, for data for atomistic systems that were generated according to the same distribution as your training data. This is the classic machine learning thing to do, but um, it's a good question still because it, it, this is certainly not enough. I, I'm digressing a little bit here, but uh, how, the question is, I think, how do you judge how good a machine learning potential is? And that's a difficult question. But I think the, what everyone can agree on is perhaps that once you have shown that you have low retrospective errors in energies and forces, well, use the machine learning to run a simulation. And if your simulation crashes, then your potential was not so good, right? Um, so I'm, I'm summarizing here, right? But uh, for high dimensional machine learning potentials, holes, so-called holes in the potential energy surface, where there's just not enough training data to make a good prediction are an actual problem that can be taken care of, but it has to be taken care of, right? So use the potential and then you will see how good it is. That, that is my answer to how do you measure that? Um, yeah. Okay, and here in this, let's, let's not spend too much time on this slide. The, the point is compared to uh, frequently used DFT parameterizations, current state-of-the-art machine learning potentials are about three to four orders of magnitude faster, which is a substantial improvement, right? Otherwise, this whole thing wouldn't be worth it. Uh, and if you really go for speed, you can get another three to four orders of magnitude. I'll come back to that. So here's a sketch demonstrating the idea, and then I will show some work from our group. Um, so if you, it, this, it, this is again the same idea of learning the potential energy surface. Here in this sketch, the horizontal axis is your atomistic system. So the coordinates of your atoms and whatever chemical species and whatever else information you have there, um, like spins, for example, or uh, um, yeah, let's not get into that. Uh, excitations, for example, what about charges and so on, but let's not, let's not talk about that. So let's just think the horizontal axis is positions and chemical element species encoded somehow in a high dimensional vector space, let's say, right? So the horizontal axis is a high dimensional space and the vertical axis is what you want to predict. Let's say the energy. You can also try to predict tensor value properties, but also let's not go to that. And then the black line would be like, if you could use your up initial reference like DFT or quantum Monte Carlo or couple cluster to calculate the solutions for many, many points in this input space, but you can't. 
because it's too expensive. And what you, but what you can do is you can do some calculations, so the red points, the reference calculations, and then train a machine learning on these points, right? On your selected reference calculations. And then you get a fit, the blue dashed line. And if you have done your job well, then it will be close to the up initial reference. And then you can use the machine learning potential instead of the up initial potential, getting the speed up for the larger sizes. There's a lot to be said about this, for example, but, but let's not do that. Um, maybe just mention one point here um, that I think is important. If you have a finite number of training points and you fit a very high dimensional flexible function through them, well, of course, there are many possible solutions, right? So you have to make additional assumptions. And uh, it turns out that the usual machine learning technique that is a definer, so-called regularizer that controls the smoothness or complexity of your fitted surface, that that goes along well with up initial potential energy surfaces. They tend to be smooth, which we can exploit here. So we find the smoothest function through our training data. There are many other points like this, but let's not stick with them today. So briefly, I want to show one example in this general introduction. Uh, so this is work from my group. We are using the, we want, we are interested, I mentioned that we are interested in predicting properties of materials. And here we are trying to predict the thermal conductivity of a material, so how well it transports heat. And we want to use so-called green Kubo formalism for this, which requires us to run long simulations of large supercells. I will not go into the green Kubo method here, but uh, if you're a physicist, you will have an easy time figuring it out. Um, I just want to say we need long simulation times and large supercells. And here you see a preliminary result figure. So on the horizontal axis, you see the simulation time in nanoseconds. And on the vertical axis, you see the estimated thermal transport coefficient kappa. And the different lines are different sizes of unit cells. And this is for zirconia. So pristine zirconia, no, no real things like uh, defects, interstitials, whatnot. No, it's just pristine zirconia. And this, we chose zirconia because we had reference data from a previous purely up initial study. That is the black one line here, right? And that was a substantial computational effort at the time. And you see how far it got, right? You, at that, the black line, you don't know whether you're converged in time, and indeed you're not. And you don't know whether you're converged in size. This is about 100 atoms, and indeed you're not. So, but if you run a machine learning potential, in this case, we used a neural network potential, Schnett, the author of which sits here, Christoph Schitt, hi. And he, I'm sure he will talk about that too, or about the successor perhaps, Payne. Um, so, and then you see that we can easily run long simulations. We can do a thousand atoms, a few thousand atoms. And then we see, okay, if you run for half a nanosecond and have a thousand atoms, we are approximately good. That the graph itself would need a lot more explanation, um, but, but this is the gist of it. Yeah? Okay, um, here's a comparison with experimental data and also other machine learning models. But here also, I think the statement is just, if you compare the red diamonds um, with the black crosses, um, you see that we are roughly in the right vicinity compared to experiment. Um, yeah, and that's that. I wanted to show that as an example. And now the other thing I want to show today is some uh, machine learning potential that we are actually currently developing. And I should say as a prelude that people at the moment use mostly three different types of machine learning approaches for machine learning potentials. That is linear models, kernel models, and neural networks. And they all have the different trade-offs. Maybe I can come back to that, I'm not sure. Um, and here, and here, this is an attempt, well, maybe it's at the other end of the spectrum of neural networks, whatever that means. Let me show you. So what we try to do here is we said, okay, let's not jump on any hype train right now, but let's take the concepts that we think will lead to a machine learning potential that is both extremely fast, as fast as classical potentials, like Leonard Jones potential, for example, still on Joe Weber uh, or Morse potential. So extremely fast. I don't think you can be much faster without coarse graining. Uh, and that at the same time will be robust and interpretable. So we didn't aim for the highest accuracy. And indeed, this is not 
uh, the accuracy of this model will not be it's not comparable to the accuracy, for example, of a large neural network potential. And because it has much many fewer parameters, right? But it's robust. It doesn't have faults, and it can yeah, you know, and it's interpretable. You can plot the different components and look at them. Uh, yeah. So what? How did we do that? Okay. One trick that basically any potential does uh, to be able to scale up to large systems is you don't predict the energy of the whole system. You can, with machine learning, you can do that. You take all the coordinates of all the atoms at once and predict the energy, but that's problematic for larger systems. You have too many degrees of freedom. So what you do is you assume that your energy can be written as a sum of atomic energy contributions. To be clear, this is not the case. This is an approximation. The energy is a many body function of the atomic coordinates, but you can approximate it this way. And it turns out in practice, this often works quite well. And then you predict atomic energy contributions for each atom and sum them up. Yeah? So that's what we use. And that's much easier. It's a much easier problem because you only need to consider a few neighbors around the atom. And a few. Yeah. That's maybe in a radius of three to 10 angstroms on that scale. So we use this standard trick. Then we do our model is not um, a model is a many body expansion. So we say the we have a one body term, so one constant offset per chemical element species. We have two body terms. That is, we have energy contributions from each pair of atoms, so from the central atom in the local environment to all its neighbors, but separately. And we have three body terms. For example, we could do higher order terms. This is a very well known thing to do. Um, and it's different from most of the current machine learning potentials that are uh, have higher fitting capacity because they look at the local atomic environment as a whole. Whereas we just look at all the pairs and all the triplets. I mean, the, our method never sees all of them together. Um, but we pay with accuracy, but we gain in uh, computational efficiency and robustness. Okay, finally, how do we represent these one, two, three body terms? Well, we use for two body terms, it's easiest to see, right? A two body term is just a function, as the atomic energy contribution is just a function of the distance between two atoms. And we learn such functions using splines. Splines are low order polynomials that have uh, finite support. Finite support is important because imagine, imagine you have like the distance and you have the potential and you place small polynomials along the distance axis. And then you evaluate and you fit their coefficients, and that gives you a, for a 2D function, uh, a 2D potential, pair potential as a function of your data. And these, uh, since these little functions you put there, the spines have a local support. When you evaluate the potential, you, in our case, uh, we only ever evaluate at most four of these low order potentials. And that is extremely fast to do. So this is well known. Splines are a well known technique. They have, they are rediscovered by any, every generation, basically, right? Um, and then we use some ideas from more modern machine learning. If, for example, for the regularization, we don't use the usual regularizer, but we uh, we regularize the curvature. So we are saying like if you if you have data and then the data stops, but here we have data again. Well, then choose the function, choose the coefficients such that the function doesn't changes as little as possible. And this is very easy to do in our setup. It can be done for high dimensional potentials, but it's much more, um, much more, it's a bit more complicated. Okay, of course, in these five minutes, you can, I mean, hopefully I gave you some keywords, but right? you can look up, it's on the archive. You can read the whole preprint if you would like. Uh, so here's a question. If the machine learned potential is uh, trained on density functional theory, you don't have to, you can. Usually it's done, but that's because uh, Concham DFT is so popular. You can train it on any reference you want to. And indeed, for example, in my group, we are currently building models based on quantum Monte Carlo reference calculations. So most of the time it's DFT, but that's because DFT is popular. That's the main reason. Okay, so what do we do with that? Um, well, Here's uh, the, the right column is just some phonon spectra to show you that it works. There's a lot more validation in the preprint. And on the left, what you see here is on the horizontal axis computational cost. So how fast it is, right? Lower corner is density functional theory. In the middle, you have some state of the art potentials like um, gap soap, for example. And we have, we have a newer version of this graph that also has moment tensor potential. So we have 
current state of the art there, all of it, of course, but some of it. And on the very left, you have classical potentials like Leonard Jones, LJ, and Morse, and all refitted to the same tungsten data in this case. And you have our ultra fast potential in the two and two and three body parameterization. And we are happy that it improves on the current Pareto frontier of uh, error versus efficient, also computational requirements. Basically, it works somehow. And now at the moment, we are trying to apply it to as many systems as possible to learn about the limitations, right? It will fail eventually because it has limited fitting capacity, but the question is when. Yeah. And uh, let's not get into this. Here's some preliminary experiments on the zirconia that I mentioned, and you see basically the DFT versus the UF energy. But there's a question, do we have any control on the errors of the model or some systematic way to improve results? Yes, I'll come back to that in a moment. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, the same for the forces. And you see, sure, if you have a large data set and a high capacity model, then this would be like almost a straight line for the energies and a very enclosed it for the forces. So this here has, is just for two body, I think. And this still has relative, also, it has errors that are good enough to run in ND, but we are working on improving them further. I think that's the message here. Um, so there was a question, oh yeah, error control. So uh, sure, I mean, the, the, tip, also the primary thing to do would be uh, to provide more training data, right? The more data you have for training, the more accurate your model will become. Um, and I'm not sure I will be able to remember all these questions, but maybe Patrick can help with that. So, uh, so the, the first thing you can do for a machine learning model is give it more data. As long as it has enough parameters, enough fitting capacity, it will be better the more data you throw at it. But here, I mean, here we were looking for a model that we can train with as little data as possible because we want to reduce the number of DFT calculations. Yeah. And then, yes, I mean, uh, the, the various different models have, uh, some of them have uh, predictive and also error bars like Gaussian processes have predictive variance. So they give you a measure of how reliable the prediction is if all the assumptions of the Gaussian process model are fulfilled, which they are usually not. But uh, you can build ensemble models that are the same. Um, you can analyze your errors. For example, you can also try and uh, instead of minimizing the root mean squared error, so a form of average error, you can try to minimize the maximum error. This is a bit more tricky and more volatile. And of course, you will make uh, it has problems, but you can. So there's a lot of things you can do technically to play with your model and understand your errors better and improve them in a way, but whichever way is necessary for your particular application. For example, one thing that can be important uh, for high dimensional machine learning potentials is um, to recognize when your simulation has moved into a corner of phase space where you don't have enough training data because your predictions will be unreliable then. This simple model here doesn't have this problem as much because it doesn't have so much fitting capacity, right? These are all low dimensional, like two and three dimensional fits, and uh, you need, don't need much data. And, and when you can look at them and check that they're roughly physical, and then you just run the simulation. This, the accuracy will be not the same, of course, but it, it will provide a robust baseline. Okay, let me go to the end of this, more data on hydrogen under pressure. And uh, yeah, let's, let's skip all of this now. Okay, that's good. I just wanted to give uh, a very short uh, general introduction to machine learning and uh, a spotlight on what we're doing in my group. And I would suggest that we are now answering questions and then we move to the second part where I will um, talk a little bit about kernel-based machine learning. Thank you. Okay, I see the first question. Thank you for a nice talk. Can you go back to these zirconia results? It's very loud. Okay. So here. No. On, mm, yes. Oh, this one? No, the following. This one. This one. So could you, do, do you have a, an order of magnitude for the number of, you know, DFT calculations you had to produce for the training set that you show here? Just because you said this is much more efficient. Just yes, to... yes, yes, yes. Okay, I can try. Um... <laughs> Look at this, for example. Um, on the left-hand side, you have 
a comparison between uh, UF2 and 3 body parametrization. And on the right, you have a high dimensional potential based as a SNAP and QSNAP, which is based on the bi spectrum. It's, it's a good one, let's say. And if you look at the horizontal axis, we have number of training data, number of training configurations. And on the vertical axis, we have errors, top row energy, bottom row forces. Now, if you look at this, you will notice different things. Um, okay. Uh, well, the point here being that the high dimensional models on the, in the right column, they start out higher with the same training amount of training data, right? Because they have more parameters. It's harder to fit them. Whereas our model starts out low, but then they improve a lot more. And if you feed them more data, they will improve further. Whereas our model saturates relatively quickly. And you asked for quantitative data. So if you look at the horizontal axis, you see that already at about in the top row where we have like 10 training points, uh, we're already not that bad. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Right? And, and those are random configurations. So you, you generate. Yes. Okay. At the moment, for uh, I mean, we are currently setting this up, right? For a real application, we wouldn't choose random structures, but you could think about, for example, generate. Um, well, uh, that's actually not a trivial point because, uh, okay. Oh well. Um, for example, if you build a high dimensional potential and then you run a simulation, you might discover you need more data in some mm -hmm. region. Then you need to actively learn that. So my current idea of how I want to use this is um, if, okay, if you're given a set of data, you could use a simple heuristic, like choose K points, which are furthest from each other in a greedy way. And start with one, choose the first one apart, then choose the third one, which is the furthest apart from the other two and so on. And that covers roughly your space, right? And uh, if you have here, what we could also do is you could run, you could have very few data, train at potential, this potential here, which can deal with little data, run a simulation, then you have a large number of different configurations, use the K per this, per this point heuristic and do the DFT for some of them, retrain the model and so on. Hopefully a low number of iterations set up that, that will be robust. Let's see. Okay, thanks. Okay, question at the back. Thank you for the talk. Um, I just was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how N um, errors in terms of RMSEs map to errors in your observables like um, your kappa. And um, if, you, if you systematically kind of looked at tuning your, your machine learning model um, in terms of RMSEs and then seeing how um, that affects uh, your, the accuracy and what you really care about. Yeah, thank you. That is a very good question. I would also like to know. Um, so in principle, one should be, and I think someone has recently done this actually for machine learning potential. Um, you can propagate your uncertainties uh, through to your uh, final um, observable that you're interested, like the thermal conductivity, but we haven't done that in, our, in my group. So otherwise, um, I cannot give you any quantitative, uh, anything quantitative here, but yeah, I would say the general feeling is that uh, once you have reached a, whatever that is, a sufficiently accurate model, it doesn't matter if you make it more accurate or not, it, then it's probably more worth spending your time on uh, getting the calculation for the observable right, maybe uh, fix other parts of the model. Or right? as a, So we seem to observe that it's not necessary, as a, just increasing the accuracy of the machine learning potential for its own sake is not necessary for uh, to get a reasonably converged observables. But I cannot give you any numbers right now. I might be in a few months from now. From now. Uh, thank you for this very nice talk. So my question is that when calculating the uh, thermal conductivity for the, the conium oxide, how do we define the heat flux? The heat flux? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if I can answer this right now, but what I can say is we looked into different definitions of the heat flux and we saw, and for example, for the network, for the machine learning potential that we chose, 
this SNET model, that's a message passing neural network. And we saw, for example, that uh, the original heat flux definition we wanted to use uh, wouldn't have been right because there is information coming from outside the local cutoff radii. So we adapted the heat flux. We're currently writing that up. So if you wait, maybe, I don't know how long, but hopefully less than, less than three months, then, you, then I, you can read the answer to this question. But it was, yeah, it was, um, it was an important point of all of this, how to define which heat flux definition to choose, which implementation, right? There, for example, in LAMS, uh, for a while, there was a wrong implementation. So it was, it was not, a, so it was an important part of this study. Yeah. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk. I did want to make a, a remark related to the uncertainty propagation, which is something I've been working on uh, in Michele Ceriotti group. So the idea is you start by having uh, uncertainty on the energies and you use the reweighting schemes and propagation schemes uh, to account for uh, yeah this uncertainty on top of the uncertainty on the observable due statistical sampling. And what did what we did find is that if your uncertainty on the energy is uh, somehow the one uh, we would accept in this community, then it turns out that uh, it's not uh, particularly damaging on the convergence of the statistical observable itself. The math is a bit complicated, but uh, we can discuss further later on. Did you recently have a preprint on this? in the conformational space. I mean, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, very recently, together with Aldo, Andrea, and Claudio, we did publish also uh, a comparison between uncertainty on energies because, for example, of uh, committee, mo I mean, through, calculated through committee models and uh, distances uh, according to the sampling density. And this is something Aldo Yelmo will also touch upon in a tutorial next week so thank you very much for the assist yeah you're welcome i think it's an important topic so i think we're moving on to expert questions here so maybe one more it's not an expert question and um, so i just wanted to know in the slide you showed where you um showed the computational cost versus the error of the model you probably said it already but i missed what data did you oh uh, this was on a tungsten data set by gabor ah okay yeah. So, so this was a data set of pure elemental tungsten. So no, it's just one component, but it had a lot of, of um, a variety in the structure. So bulk and surfaces, defects. One so yeah, but by now we have also applied it to other, other data sets, of course. Um, there might also be questions in the chat now. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, we're looking at it now. Um, which one? Uh, so as a learner of ML, I would like to first verify the, the, the ML method in calculating some electronic property of a set of DFT optimized materials available in literature. What should be the procedure? Well, there's a lot of benchmark data in the literature by now, but of course it's important to understand what you can demonstrate with a given data set. For example, I think Felix mentioned this, uh, there is a, the, the QM9 data set, which has about 130,000 small organic molecules with some properties calculated for them on the DFT level. But these are in their ground state minimum. So if you train on part of this data set and predict the rest, um, then you know how good your model can predict these properties when the structure is in the ground state, right? But it doesn't tell you if you can take a random starting structure and relax it into the ground set with your model because the model has never seen anything like that. So be careful, uh, right, about what you can learn from a data set. That said, there's lots of free data sets available, which is great. Um, there are all kinds of materials data set. Oh yeah, when you do much, also, and you also have to pay a bit attention on, yeah, what you're doing with the machine learning. If you're doing something like a machine learning potential, it's important that your data set is homogeneous in the sense of, for example, you cannot just uh, 
pull down data from the materials project and just use it. I mean, you can, of course, but you, your error will be not as low as it could be because some of the materials have been trained with different settings as far as I remember, for example, the k-point density. And um, if for, imagine, for example, half of your data set is trained with the one uh, settings for your DFT method and the other one is trained with slightly different settings. So from the point of view of the machine learning model, these are two different functions. And it tries to learn two different functions at the same time, which will only work up until the differences between the two functions, right? That can happen accidentally too. For example, I know a story where someone was uh, running the DFT calculations on his cluster. And when he trained the machine learning model, it didn't work as well as he expected it to. And he found out on half of the machines in the cluster, there was a constant offset to the energy for whatever reason. No one figured out why, but it was there, right? So this, this episode is maybe interesting also in that it shows that training a machine learning model can also be used to identify problems in the data. This aspect is not so often investigated, but I think it's an interesting one. Yeah, but, but yes, again, I mean, look at quantum dot, uh, slash uh, quantum slash machine learning org, for example, I think is the address or qml.org um, or just look at the tons of literature. So there's lots of data, lots of data available freely. So I think there are no more questions from the chat that we haven't already addressed. So I think since I don't see any other questions, we can probably move on. Okay, great. Then let's change gears now and switch from this. And let's find out if I can use my iPad. Yeah, let's switch to uh, learning with kernels. So as I mentioned, there are three major model classes around for machine learning potentials, but also for many other tasks in the materials community. They are not the as a linear kernel and the neural networks. There are other methods like random forests, for example, but they tend to be used less often for whatever reason. And then there are also, of course, special methods developed for a particular application. But yeah, linear kernel and neural networks. And here I would like to talk a bit about the kernel learning. So I cannot do all of this now, right? <laughs> we already spent some time. But surely I want to cover the introduction and the key ideas behind kernel learning. Um, Let's see how detailed we can do the regression, but at least show a little bit about how to do regression with kernels. Let's take a look at a few standard kernels and briefly address how kernels are characterized mathematically. And I think that's how much we can do. So I'll, see, I'll be very selective uh, in the content here because of time. So what is kernel learning? Which problem does kernel learning address? So the problem is, if you have the choice and a linear model works for you, then absolutely take the linear model. It's much easier to train, it's more robust, it's faster than all the others. But, and we understand linear models, right? Least squares regression, principal component analysis. There, there are literally dozens of algorithms, um, linear algorithms. But data is often nonlinear. And if your data is nonlinear, you have to do something about it, right? Um, so what can you do? So and by, by nonlinear, I mean, let's look at the regression problem. You have a set of inputs, let's call them xi. This could be, for example, x could be a description of an atomistic system. You have your outputs, your labels, uh, yi, for example, the energy of that configuration. And, the, and you, have, you want to learn the map from the x to the y. Huh? That's supervised learning. Um, but learning, yeah, regression, basically. So how, what can you do if the function that you want to learn is nonlinear? Well, you can use a nonlinear algorithm. That would be a neural network, for example. Uh, so you have a nonlinear model and try to capture the nonlinearity with that. You can also try to change your input features. So for example, if your inputs are described by, let's say, three dimensions, A, B, C, okay, just use more features like the original ABC, but also A squared, AB, B squared, C squared, EC, ABC, right? Products, for example. If you use products, what you get is polynomial regression. You get a lot of new features. And since these features are nonlinear functions of the original input features, maybe a linear model in these nonlinear features can capture your nonlinearity. 
or you can try to do that systematically and implicitly learn these new nonlinear features. Uh, that, was, that wasn't said entirely right. Um, you can try to, I, I'll show you, in the, you can try curl methods. I'll show on the next slide. Um, yeah, so let, let's look at an example. That's maybe better. So here you see an example of a classification problem. So our Ys are either orange or blue, and we have only one input dimension X. And the task here would be to separate the two classes. So uh, maybe we're good to remember. So a, if you have a linear model, that means you have, for example, here, if you find, you want to find a, a dividing hyperplane, a hyperplane is an object of dimension one less than the enclosing space. So in this example, you have one input dimension. So one dimension less is zero. So you need to find a zero dimensional object. that is a point on this line that separates the two classes. Yeah? This is not possible in this case. It's a nonlinear problem and your linear model doesn't work. Yeah? So, but what you can do is you can transform your features. For example, by adding a second feature, which in this case here is the sign of the first one. And now again, a linear model is now our input space is two dimensional, one less a one dimensional object, so a line that separates the two classes. And indeed, the, the x axis here uh, neatly separates the two classes. So, what has happened here is a, a nonlinear problem in a low dimensional space became a linear problem in a high dimensional space yeah? by applying the right transformation. And that is what kernel learning is about, or well, half of it, let's say. Um, you want to somehow transform your input features such that your problem becomes nonlinear, uh, sorry, linear in the new features. And the, the other half is uh, we want to do this implicitly. Why implicitly? I can do this explicitly, right? And I take my input points X and I just add a second dimension sign X and that's it. And you can, but if in a real problem, you might have hundreds or thousands of input dimensions. And then if you add like the products, like in the slide before, then maybe you add polynomially many dimensions. Very soon, you will have too many dimensions, too many features to do your linear regression uh, explicitly, yeah? because you will have too many features. It turns out there are also interesting spaces where you can do regression in that are infinitely dimensional. And then, well, how do you do that explicitly, right? It's a bit tricky. So you want to avoid that. And how can you do that? Well, the second part is the observation that there is a class of functions, the kernels, which you evaluate in your original input space here on the left. So k, the kernel function, takes two inputs from your original space, so that we put two points here on the line, and it returns a number and the property of kernels is that this number is the same number you would have gotten if you had calculated the inner product in this high dimensional space with the new features, yeah? the transformed space. So instead of having to explicitly compute inner products in this high dimensional space where it will not be practical often, you can calculate the kernel function in the original space and you get the same numbers. So kernels are a way to compute inner products in a high dimensional space without, without ever going there, staying in your original low dimensional space. And these two things together, nonlinear transformation plus implicitly working in that space through kernel functions, this is what is called the kernel trick. Okay, so that was the gist of it in a nutshell. Let's take a more careful look at this. Oh, yeah, or maybe one, one more other thing before. So why inner products? I said you can calculate inner products in your high dimensional space, but why is that interesting? Well, if you think about it, inner products contain a lot of geometrical information. Imagine, for, for example, you can uh, see here that if you know inner products between points, you can compute the distance or square distance between them. So inner products can tell you something about distances between points. And it also, they also contain angle information. The cosine of this um, theta here is, uh, you can compute it using the inner product and two distances, which again, you can compute using inner products. So if you can compute inner products, you can get angular information. 
And that means, um, imagine, for example, you have n training, n points, x1 to xn, and you know all the pairwise kernel evaluations, all the pairwise inner products. Well, then you know all the distances between these points and all the angles, which means it's a lot of geometric information. You know how every point relates to all the other points. So the inner products convey all the information that you usually need to run a linear algorithm, like a regression or a dimensionality reduction, for example. So there is some information that is not contained in the inner products. For example, you don't have an absolute origin, but usually you don't need that. And okay, let's ignore the other stuff. That is the important part why, why, why in our products. So and now you have, what you have seen so far is the key idea. And now let's take a look at an example at regression. Yeah, <laughs> here, um, my original plan was to use this blackboard, but the iPad has a notes feature. So let's see how well that goes. And I'll try to keep it a lot shorter than I planned. So I'll just, I wanted to do the complete derivations with you, but um, let's do just the, the important steps then. All right, so what's the situation? Also, let me switch to the, uh, let me also switch the microphone. So I need to be more stationary now. Okay, okay let's see how that goes. So we want to do regression. So remember, we have, Okay, we have n pairs inputs xi and corresponding labels yi. This is our input and we want to learn the function that maps xi to yi. So specifically our assumption will be that yi is some true function f that we don't know of xi plus some noise where this noise is distributed according to a normal distribution with zero mean and some variance. And importantly, this epsilon is independent and identically distributed. So we have some noise on each label, but this noise is um, uh, independent for each um, training example x, i, y, i. So that's uh, that is the situation. And notation wise, let's uh, already introduce here. We put the axis into a matrix capital X. So that will be like X1 to Xn. So this matrix is real. Uh, we have N training data and each one has D dimensions, each input vector. So what I show, so everything that I show here will be for real numbers, but you can do current methods with complex numbers as well, if that is uh, what you need. So, and we'll have a shortcut, the vector Y, which has all the Y1 to Yn. Okay, so what's the model? Also, so let's start. Okay, I think we can do at least this. So let's take a look at the linear model and then let's switch in from that to the kernel model. For the linear least squares regression, our model has this, I'll use F hat for our estimator. Of course, notation between machine learning and physics is a, whole, is a complete mess as you will find out. But there's nothing to be done about that. So our model looks like this. Okay, so, so uh, if you get a new input, let's call it Z, then our prediction is a constant offset B. And we multiply each component of the vector Z with a parameter, beta i. These are our regression coefficients. So beta is um, a d vector. And this is what we want to learn, the constant offset b and the vector beta. 
and that we will do with the help of our training data. And the first thing for now for this pedagogical exposition, we'll get rid of the B because we don't want unnecessary complexity here. And there are various tricks you can play here. Um, one trick that also works for kernel methods is, imagine you have one input dimension and one output dimension y here, uh, and here's your input x. And you need the b because you need e for this, basically. Now, if you center both your x's and your y's, you shift the whole, let's colors here, no? Let's use some colors. You shift the whole data here, right? If you subtract the mean from the x's and from the y's, you get this, and now suddenly you don't need, you just need to fit a line through the origin, you don't need the B anymore. That's how you can get rid of the B. There are many other ways, but this is one of them that also works for kernels. Okay, so we have gotten rid of the B, good. Now, how do we get the beta? Well, uh, machine learning algorithms usually are optimization problems. You define like your predictor here, and then some optimization problem, how to find the beta, you solve that using the data and that's it. So let's see how that works here. So we want to find the best beta, let's call it beta star, out of all possible betas. So arc min over all possible betas. And what are we minimizing? Well, okay. Ideally, what we want to minimize is the error over future for future data. So data coming from the same distribution as our training data that we have observed, but we can't because we, in practice, you don't know which, gener which distribution generates your data and you only have a finite data set. So what we do instead is we minimize the error on the data that we have, which is called empirical risk minimization. So what that is, is we have a sum over our N training points and we take the for those we know the label y and we subtract our prediction f hat of xi and we square that that's the squared error and if i put one over n and the square root here we have the root mean squared error now uh, i would like to very briefly digress here and say um, if you're a machine learner you can ignore the root and the one over n because it changes the value of your as it changes the value of your optimal solution, but it doesn't change its position. So you will still get the same beta. Just the, of course, if you take the square root, then the the value of the error changes, but the beta is still the same. So you can remove those. If you're a physicist, you shouldn't because your y's have units, and if you don't have the square root, then your units change, and maybe that's not so great. So remember sometimes to also here think of units. Okay, but for us, it doesn't matter. Um, we will drop the square root and everything and just take a look at this term here. Okay, how do you solve this? Um, okay, I'll very briefly go through it, uh, but not in full. So uh, first of all, we observe that we can write the f hat of xi is this sum j beta j xi jth component, but this is nothing else than beta transpose xi, right? This is just the inner product between the beta and the xi. So let's insert this here. And if you do that and you leave out the square root and everything, then I will also skip the arc min for brevity here. Then what you're left with is sum i from one to n, yi minus beta transpose xi squared. Okay, so far so good. Now let's rewrite that in matrix notation. If you look at this, we have a sum which goes from one to n, and then we have the ith entry of y, and we have the ith entry of something else. This looks like an inner, pro then it's, this is squared. So this looks like an inner product of some quantity with itself. And indeed, if you look a bit longer at it, you will see that this is simply the inner product y minus uh, beta transpose capital X transpose. And this is a bit 
pointless. Let's do, let's immediately write this as X transpose beta. So, uh, sorry, um, X beta, I should say. So Y minus X beta. So you, you can do the math in a quiet moment and if you don't see it immediately and you will, you will see that these two uh, last lines are the same. Okay, so far so good, what next? Um, now you multiply this out, right? So this is like Y transpose Y minus, yeah, just the usual like uh, Y transpose X beta and so on. Um, so this is minus two Y transpose X beta plus, no, mind the last term is, the middle two terms are the same, that's where the two comes from. And the last term is minus minus or times plus. And then you see that this is beta transpose X transpose X beta. So we want to minimize this quantity. How do we do that? Well, we notice that this is essentially a quadratic equation. And uh, so what we do is we take the derivative, also the gradient, and set it to zero. Yeah? So we want here, we say the gradient with respect to beta of this expression should be zero. And that will be the solution, right? It's like a parabola. You set the derivative to zero and that's where the optimal value, the minimal value is in this case. Okay, how do we do that? Well, um, so you notice, for example, that Y transpose Y doesn't contain a beta, so that goes. And then you need to either look up or remember the rules for taking the derivative of these uh, in linear algebra expressions, let's say. But uh, if you don't know that, look up a Peterson Matrix Cookbook on Google. You will find a lot of hits and just, this is a very nice um, uh, collection of formulas and it also has the formulas for taking the derivatives here. I put them here on the right-hand side in case you're not yet familiar with this. Um, so for example, D X transpose B X by, let's first do the simple case. D A transpose X by DX. Now X is the variable here is just A. So if we apply this here on top and we see that um, this is applicable to the middle case here and we just get uh, minus two Y transpose. Oh wait, what have I done here? X transpose. Yeah, and because of the transpose in the formula, I think that's right. And now the other formula is if you have the matrix in between, um, then you get B plus B transpose, um, oh, B plus B transpose X in this notation, yeah. So if we apply this rule to the last expression here, we see that we get plus now X transpose X plus the transpose of that, but the transpose of X transpose X is again X transpose X. So we just have two times X transpose X beta is zero. And now we're almost there, right? We divide by two, this goes, we bring everything with beta on the left-hand side, everything without beta on the right-hand side. So that is uh, X transpose X beta is plus, X transpose Y. And now we multiply with the inverse of X transpose X and we are done. Our solution, the coefficient vector beta for our linear regression is X transpose X, X trans, also to the minus one, X transpose Y, if the inverse exists. Okay, so that was uh, roughly how you derive least square, the linear least squares regression. Now, if you have this, what we will do next is we will take a look at how you uh, turn this into the kernel version of it. Yeah? So of course, I mean, this is a bit, just enjoy the show. And later you can either look this up in a textbook 
and reproduce the individual lines or just do it yourself? So how does the kernel version of this look like? like this is the gist of it now. The, so we saw a linear algorithm, right? We, we wrote down uh, our model is just a coefficient vector times the input vector. We said we want to minimize the least squares error. We rewrote the equations a little bit and found that this is the solution, yeah? this expression. Now we want to do the same thing, but only implicitly in a kernel feature space. So let's look at this. So the situation is, we do have our original input space. Let's call it calligraphic X. This is our RD. It doesn't have to be, by the way. A nice thing about kernel methods is that you can have non-vectorial input spaces. For example, you can define kernels on uh, graphs, on sheep if you want, on strings, whatever. Yeah? Um, so we'll come back to that. And now a point X here will be transformed using some transform phi uh, into a new larger space, let's call it F, the kernel feature space, so to the point phi of x. Yeah? This is the situation that we have. And we know that we have this kernel function k um, so that k of x z is the same as the inner product in the transformed space. Yeah? So this is our situation. Okay, first of all, let's do, what we will do now is we'll take the exact same model and uh, try to do it in the kernel feature space. First of all, let's write down what our model is. Our predictor f of a variable z. That used to be beta transpose z. But now we want this to happen in the kernel feature space. So this is, uh, if you want, like another f hat of phi of z. And there we have a new coefficient vector, let's call it beta prime perhaps, the transpose times phi of z, right? So, so this is conceptually what we would like to do. So the beta prime would be now in f, not in x anymore. Okay, this is from the intuition what we want to achieve. So let's write this down. F hat of Z is, we had this before as well, right? We just explicitly sum over the dimensions, but now it's the dimensions of the kernel feature space. So a different D, let's call it D prime. Beta prime I. Okay, this is wrong. I think this should be phi of Z. So, I. So this is the same equation as before, but now just written in kernel feature space. <clears throat> we can't do this explicitly because we don't have access to the phi. We just have access to k. Okay. But what we can do is we can rewrite this. So I hope I'm not too brief now. Let's see. So we have our sum, but the betas I now want to rewrite instead of beta i, beta prime i. I want to write sum j from one to n alpha j phi of xj times phi of zi. So what all I did was I took these betas and claimed that I can write them like this with some new coefficients, alpha one to alpha n. Now this is maybe not immediately obvious. And um, yeah. So Patrick, how long do I have here? Until 20 past officially. Yeah, 20 I'll past five or 20 past questions. six. <laughs> okay, all right, sorry about that. Let's, um, okay, then let, maybe let's take a quick look here why you can write this. Maybe it's better to do this one thoroughly and then the, the, over the rest we will go faster. Um, for the, if you, let me take a different, different color for this as well. So 
if okay if you look at the linear case you'll see that um the sum i from one to d so the original linear case beta i z i that you can write this as this same sum and I replace the beta i with some alpha j x j i z i. So this is the same thing as on the left hand side, but in the original input space. Now here I think this is plausible, right? Because let let us assume that we have more training data than dimensions, of course. Um, and here I think this is plausible, right? If you have uh, D dimensions and you have N input data, then you can just use your input data like a, well, not an orthogonal basis, but some, some basis for an expansion basis vectors and just write your beta in terms of these alphas. And there is a reason why you can do this in the kernel feature space as well, but I don't want to go into that reason right now because that's an orthogonal, a tangent to what we're doing right now. But maybe this is a little bit of a motivation why rewriting the beta I prime in this form is possible. And if you really want to know, you can ask me later. So um, we can do this. And now, uh, yeah, let's now just rewrite this equation a little bit and then we will see the kernel form. So we pull out the sum over the alphas. Uh, first, and then what is left in brackets is the sum uh, over the i's. And now look, okay, phi, phi of x j i, phi of z i. So now, all I've done was I pulled the sum of the alphas uh, to the beginning of the expression. And now look at this. What is, what is this here? Um, can someone see or say what this is? Well, you have to speak up really loudly, otherwise I won't hear you. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe it's a bit, a bit hard to ask. Yeah, so right, it's this, it's this, I wasn't sure if someone said the right thing because I, I don't hear you so well. Um, so if you look at this, it's the sum goes over the components and it's just from the vector phi of xj and the vector phi of z, the ith component, and you multiply them and sum up. That's an inner product, right? So this is the inner product between phi of xj and phi of z, okay? And now we're almost there because we know that the kernel function is a function that computes an inner product. So we don't know which kernel function, also there's not a specific kernel function here, right? But we know such a function exists. And um, that means I can write this as sum j from one to number of training data, coefficient alpha j times the kernel function evaluated between the jth training point and the new point z. And that's it. That's how, if you remember, maybe you remember, we started out with f hat of z. This is our prediction for a new point z. So how does this compare to the, to the linear one? Also, to recap, what we did here, this was the key point. What we did here is we, we wanted the same type of model, coefficient vector, in a, as a, in a product of coefficient vector beta with a point z, but we wanted to do it in kernel feature space. And what we did that and what we derived is that we can write this uh, expression, uh, coefficient vector beta prime in the kernel feature space times phi of z. We can write that as this sum, sum over some other coefficients alpha times the kernel function between the, all the training data and the new point z. So this is the form of our predictions. All kernel, either all or almost all kernel models have this form, right? They are a sum over the training data. You have the evaluation between the kernel function, a training point and, and the point you want to predict weighted by some coefficient alpha. Now in the interest of time, I'll be, I will now skip um, the rest. So what we did before is we wanted to find, now what we need to do is we need to find the alphas. Okay, but the best alpha is then again, arc min over all alphas. Um, 
And now we minimize the error, but um, of this model, not of the linear one. So that's uh, sum over the training data, label minus prediction, but now this prediction, no, the new one squared. And you can solve, I will not do it now because of time, but you can solve this equation the exact same way. So you uh, rewrite this as an inner product. Uh, you, uh, you want to take the gradient with respect to alpha. You do, you uh, solve for alpha and what you get. So the, the sequence of the proof is exactly the same. And what you get is alpha is uh, K inverse, all right. K inverse Y. So it, this is a little bit, so where K is my shorthand for the evaluation, all pairwise evaluation, the matrix that contains all the pairwise evaluations of the kernel function on the training data. Okay, and if that may, if the inverse exists, this is the solution that you get for alpha. So, very brief, of course, but I hope the idea came across. So that means what that means is you can, uh, if you have a your training data x i's and y i's, you have a kernel function k. You compute this matrix capital K inverted multiplied by y that gives you your coefficient vector alpha, and then you can predict new points by calculating your f of z here, this one, right? So that's your kernel regression or kernel least squares regression. So let's switch back now to the slides. Um, so I, I have to be brief now. There are various other aspects, but for example, um, you can do, you can add a ridge. The ridge is you do the same thing as before, but your optimization problem is not only minimizing the error, it also minimizes the norm of the coefficient vector uh, weighted by some lambda. This makes the model smoother. Maybe I can even show you why in a moment. And the solution looks, sorry, the solution looks pretty much the same in the linear case, except that you have this, add this lambda to the diagonal of X transpose X. And if you do the kernel version of that, you get, a similar thing you can this is a choice but it's a usual choice people make so you define a regularizer uh, now in terms of your alpha coefficient vector and if you solve again you add something to the diagonal of your kernel matrix and then do the inverse super brief here um, if you add something to the kernel matrix to the diagonal it will basically it will, okay, <laughs> it's a kind of circular problem here, but it, it makes the model smoother. We will see why hopefully still. Um, okay, so that's a comparison of the two different models. You have the linear case on the left-hand side and the kernel case on the right-hand side. And you see, instead of explicitly weighing the coefficients uh, of, for each dimension, you have now this sum over the training data. So what does this mean? What does this equation here mean? What are we doing here when we predict something in a kernel model? Well. There is, turns out, there is a nice interpretation. Um, I learned from physicists. Uh, so imagine you have one input dimension here, your x, and you place, you have, uh, uh, these are your outputs y, and you have here your training data, the orange points, and you want to learn the blue function. And now imagine you use a kernel that looks like a Gaussian function. Well, that sum, where's the sum here? This sum here is nothing. It looks like a basis set expansion, no? You have a basis function, this K, and you wait, and you put it on the different XI. So on each training point XI, you put one here of these Gaussian functions, you multiply with alpha, maybe some are negative, some are positive, some large, some small. And if you add them all up, you get the dashed line, which is roughly the blue line you wanted to learn. So you can view these models as kind of a basis set expansion, the predictions or the model itself. Okay, I'll skip this, um, I'll skip this too. I also skip this, but I want to say something at least. So what I wanted to show here is, um, we saw now one algorithm, linearly squares regression, transferred from the linear case to the kernel case. 
That has been done as a kernel methods were invented in the mid 90s by Wapnik and co-workers. They did support vector machines. They didn't realize their approach was generic, but they just did this one algorithm for classification. And then later, uh, uh, Bernard Schulkopf, Alex Muller and Klaus Robert Müller um, derived uh, use the same idea to derive kernel principal component analysis. And then people, they saw, oh, okay, people saw, well, this is a general approach. And then basically every linear algorithm that people could find was kernelized. Yeah? Uh, and I wanted to show here one more example, uh, how you can, I mentioned the centering before, right? You center your inputs, X and your Ys, your labels. But for the kernel algorithm, you have the labels you can still center like before, subtract the mean of the YI, but the inputs xi you now have to center in kernel feature space not in the original input space and you can do this <laughs> you can you do this as you 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 can well i can't show you the solution right maybe i can no i cannot okay um but you you start you do basically you follow the same ansatz you, you first you write down what you do in the original input space you just subtract one over n sum i xi the mean of the xi and then you try to do that in the kernel feature space. And the way you do it is like, given a kernel K, you figure out how you have to like transform that kernel so that your your it's like the previous like the original kernel, but the with a centering in the kernel feature space. So I am maybe from this explanation, it's not clear how to do it, but <laughs> okay, at least no that you can do the centering in the kernel feature space. And it's just another example of an algorithm and how you can kernelize it. Yeah, let's see, but I, I think we don't have the time to do that. Okay, now we talked about algorithms. Let's have at least a look at some kernels, right? Uh, so how do kernels look like? Let's skip this here. Uh, yeah, so the simplest kernel you can do is the linear kernel. The linear kernel is like the identity, nothing happens. Right. It, it, if you take the linear kernel, so just the inner product in the original input space, that's it. Your transformation of phi is the identity. You get the original algorithm back, and that's a formal statement. So if you if you take the kernel rich regression from before, you insert the linear kernel, or you rearrange the terms, and you get the original linear uh, rich regression back uh, exactly. So the yeah. Okay, now in what you see here is like how the linear functions look where they're just lines and let's see it for the next one. This is a very often used kernel. Here we see a bit more, it's called the Gaussian kernel. On the left-hand side, you see how the function, the kernel function looks like, yeah, Gaussians with a length scale sigma. And well, so, so you see, you take the distance in the original um, input space, you have a scale factor sigma and then you take the negative exponential. And if you draw functions from a stochastic process that is governed by this kernel function, you get these functions here. And you see that these are very smooth functions because the Gaussian is very smooth. Yeah? Um, this is an interesting kernel because you can show, it's possible to show that it corresponds to an infinite dimensional kernel feature space. So, okay, well, and this uh, this kernel is a kernel that works well for many problems, but it's also not the best kernel for many problems. Why? Because this kernel is like a kind of universal local approximator in the following sense. You see here that we have this distance in the denominator. And think about it, what happens? If the two points X and Z in the original input space are very close, then the distance is zero and that the kernel takes on the value one in the limit, okay? But if the points are very far apart, the distance will be very large and it's, uh, the kernel goes to zero. But remember the kernel corresponds to an inner product. And if an inner product is zero, it means the input vectors are orthogonal. So in other words, this kernel maps uh, far away inputs in the original input space into orthogonal dimensions in the kernel feature space. So you can fit whatever you want. But the this downside is, of course, you need a lot of data. Okay, well, that's maybe as much as I can say in a nutshell. This is the same kernel. Maybe you really, I mean, you know this probably. We call it, as I called it here, Laplacian kernel. We have basically the same thing, but I chose one norm and no square. And these have a cusp, and you can model less smooth functions with this kernel. There are tons of other kernels, literally a lot of them. Uh, I will not go into details here. 
this is an example of a graph kernel. So where you can define a kernel, not on vector input data, but on graphs directly as inputs. But the kernel is then algorithmically defined, right? Um, so you can define kernels on graphs, on sequences, like think of, for example, DNA sequences, on text, on strings, whatever you want, point clouds. Okay. Uh, now, what I still want to say is, what are these kernel functions? Do we know? And the answer is yes. A nice thing about kernel learning is that there's a lot of theory. So you can characterize these functions. It turns out the kernel functions are exactly the symmetric positive semi-definite functions. And well, let me skip the formal definition here, but you might realize later if you look at this that these are the same as the covariance functions, which is interesting. And indeed, the kernel, if you want, you can think about the kernel as encoding how the inputs vary together. So covariance between the inputs. Um, yeah, but the point here is there's an exact mathematical characterization of these functions. And that means if you have a new function, you can check whether it's a kernel or not, which is good, right? And if it is a kernel, then all the theory applies to it. And that's also a nice thing, right? Because uh, of this structure, you can use any kernel learning algorithm. So kernel linear regression, uh, sorry, kernel rich regression, kernel principal component analysis, whatever, kernel official, official discriminant, kernel support vector machines, all the long list together with every kernel, right? As long as your function is a kernel function, you can use it with any of these algorithms, which is nice. You, that means you can, uh, every kernel stands for a certain type of nonlinearity and you can use every one of the kernelized algorithms with any of the nonlinearities for which you have a kernel. So you can combine them whichever way you need them to. Uh, okay, let's skip this. Oh yeah, maybe, sorry, um, one thing I want to say. Um, a, a matrix and thus then a, 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 a kernel function is positive semi-definite if, and then there are various characterizations. I don't want to go into that because we're out of time, but one characterization is all the eigenvalues of every kernel matrix you can form from a kernel function are non-negative. And if you remember, maybe not, but we had this regularizer which added a constant to the diagonal. And that means it, um, it not only, yeah, okay, sorry, it's too much too far apart. It, it, it improves the inversion of the matrix from before. And also it makes it more, for example, if you have a function that is almost a kernel function, like it has the matrices that you can form from it sometimes have small negative eigenvalues. Well, if you add a small constant to the diagonal, you shift the eigenvalues up by that constant and voila, your function is positive semi-definite. Uh, as long as the, you're only slightly off the positive semi-definiteness, you can correct it this way. But maybe this is a minor point and maybe you shouldn't have brought it up. The important part is you can characterize these functions. And the other important part is um, you can build new kernels from old ones, like uh, building blocks, right? If you, uh, um, so formally the set of kernel functions is a closed convex cone. And it means uh, if you multiply by a non-negative scalar, it's again a kernel. If you add two kernels, it's a kernel. If you do a pointwise product, it's a kernel. If you do outer, what is this thing here? outer product, then um, again, a kernel and so on. So you have certain operations under which the class of kernel functions is closed. And so you can combine these kernels into new kernels. For example, to make this a, bit, a little bit more plastic, at least, let's say you have a linear trend in your data, but it also oscillates. Well, maybe you can combine a linear kernel with an oscillatory kernel to model your data. Okay, I'll skip the representer theorem. I'll skip the reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Basically, you can prove that um, if you have a symmetric positive semi-definite function, you can always construct a kernel feature space uh, that corresponds to it and vice versa. Um, yeah, but unfortunately we don't have time for that. Ah, this I still want to say. So I said that kernel learning has a lot of theory and it's true. And for example, in a neural network, you never know whether you found a good optimum or not for your solution. And for the kernel learning algorithms to find the parameters like the alpha before, that is a convex problem and you always find the global optimum. So that sounds nice, but there are also free parameters like the length scale in that Gaussian kernel. 
So what about those? We call them hyperparameters. What about those? And uh, it turns out for those, you don't have that nice theory. So that's a non-convex global optimization problem. Well, go figure. So uh, you, you have to find either good heuristics for your free parameters. You can do a systematic search like grid search. If you have few of them, you can minimize the likelihood of the models. You can try to do a gradient descent somehow, but you can't get around the problem of uh, that it's a non-convex optimization problem. So kernel methods also have this problem, but in a reduced form. Um, that's maybe good to know. I will not go into details. Hyperparameter optimization, if you do it, if you want to do it well and robustly, is not so, actually not so easy. Um, but if you can get away with the grid search, it's usually fine. Okay, anyway. Uh, so this is, if you, if you want a mental picture, this is about it, yeah? The, the dirty corner of hyperparameter optimization. This is, I think, from Boeing 747. It has probably about a thousand knobs and dials. And today, that's hyperparameter. Well, that's how, that's the proper image for hyperparameter optimization. But there has been some progress in AutoML and such. So maybe today it looks more like this. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> a little bit better, but still, you have to somehow choose good values for your free parameters. Um, yeah, so I wanted to cover a few specialties of um, atomistic machine learning potential, but I can't. But let me, uh, let me just mention them. Yeah? So what do you do if you don't have labels for everything? It's like you want to predict atomic energy contributions, but you only have a label for the sum of certain atomic energy contributions. Turns out you can still do it. Maybe one of the other lecturers will mention it. Um, I think, yeah, I'll come back to literature. So you can do it. Then derivatives, so important, right? If you do DFT, you also get the forces and you want to learn with the forces because they contain a lot of valuable information. But let me skip one slide. Look at this, right? Um, here are some functions from a Gaussian process prior, whatever that means. It's your possible models, basically. And here we have training data, these pluses. And so only the functions that go through them are now valid. But if we have derivatives, we have so much more information, right? Because we can not only tell go through this point, we can go like this through the point, right? So you need, if you get the derivatives for free, you need a lot less data in some sense. So, and uh, you can incorporate that into kernel uh, models because the derivative of a, a kernel regression model is still a kernel regression model. Without going into the details, you can calculate kernel values between like here, energy, 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 force, 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 and it can get like a block, blockwise kernel matrix structure. But the point is you can train with derivatives and you can take the derivative of your model. That's the point, let me skip that. Let me skip that as well. And no dimensionality reduction today, but maybe an outlook, or maybe not. Uh, so I want to say, oh, we are at time, right? But I want to say one thing. Um, so we saw now a glimpse of kernel methods, right? And we saw a linear regression model. So, okay, and we know they're neural networks, but when do we choose which method, right? Uh, and I think there are two things I want to mention. One thing is, so uh, if you really have very few data, maybe consult a statistician, right? But if you have like on the order of tens to thousands of data points or 10,000s, kernel methods are a good choice. And they scale uh, cubically in the, because you have to do this matrix inversion, cubically in the number of training data and linear when you predict in the number of training data when you predict something. So, and you need to store the kernel matrix or compute it on the fly, but you have to do either one of these two things. And that means, yeah, if it's as a, if you invert a matrix that's like 10,000 by 10,000, you don't even have to wait if you have efficient code. And if you want to invert a kernel matrix like 40,000 by 40,000, okay, maybe wait a little bit, but still okay. If it's much larger, you will have to wait or have large computers or both. Um, but, so that seems to suggest that for this small to medium range here, kernel methods are a good choice. And if you have really big data, um, maybe use a neural network. But, and that is the other point I want to make, you can, if you want to, you can fix most of the disadvantages of, the, of different methods. For example, for the kernel learning, you can, if your kernel matrix is too large, you can do a reduced rank approximation of the kernel matrix. And then 
you can do your hundred thousands points and no problem. Okay. Well, that's maybe what I can say in the brevity of time. Let's skip that. Yeah, let's summarize. So what did we see? We saw the kernel trick, implicitly running algorithms in a high dimensional space by using kernel functions that correspond to inner products in that space. We saw how to do that for regression. We saw three default standard kernels and we discussed very, very briefly a few aspects of this. Yeah. And then I want to mention that you can do a lot more with kernel methods than I showed today naturally, right? I mentioned the structured inputs. You can have structured output learning, uh, predict tensors, predict graphs if you want. We mentioned the reduced rank approximation. There's so much theory. So there's a lot more than that. Okay, and with that, I want to conclude. Also, hand over to Patrick. Okay, thank you, Matthias. And I think the hyperparameters will come back at you tomorrow in the tutorial. So you get to fly one of those Boeings too. Uh, question. Yeah, thank you. Very inspiring talk. So I have one very general question more related also to the first half of the lecture. So, so it's very natural that the high dimensional space, the data is very sparse. So for like, there was the example of those uh, ultra fast potentials and the uh, snap potentials. So it's uh, naturally that with smaller amount of data, the complex model will work worse. And the low, more simple model with uh, the error will saturate faster because the coverage is already quite general. So then it comes to a little bit related to this part. So how these very simple methods can work so well, even if our problems are often very complex, or at least we think they are very complex. And maybe a little bit like a continuation for it. Does this really a bit like a refer that are we always thinking this, that if, is there really something underlying there, which more like a refers that it's a more, more simple is more beautiful, beautiful. Like, do you have any kind of an thought about this? <laughs> Well, uh, can you make your question more specific, perhaps? Uh, more like why these simple methods, like a kernel-based methods, which is for just a linear regression in a kernel space. Oh, so it's okay, like okay. A, how yes, it can yes. work so well. Okay, okay, yes, yes, I, I, I understand. Well. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so if, let me repeat repeat your question to see if I got it right. You're saying we have a relatively simple model like linear regression. We just do it now in this kernel feature space, but it's still linear regression there, so a simple model. And yet we can fit complicated phenomena, right? Roughly, okay. So, well, I mean, it depends on the number of features, right? So the, the more features you have, I mean, of course, they cannot be all the same, right? But even if they're correlated, right? The more features you add, the more coefficients you add, the more flexibility you have in your model. And that's why you can fit many things with, with a simple linear model because you have a lot of features basically. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, in the slide where you mentioned about the radial basis function. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about, and I don't remember right now. So you mentioned that so it's very clear that it's trying to find how close two vectors are in the feature space. And you mentioned about uh, this orange curve. Can you just repeat? And then I can ask the question that I had in my mind. Yes. So what we see, also this is for the example of this Gaussian kernel as uh, I've written in the first row. And what we see is on the left-hand side, the shape of this function for different values of the parameter sigma of the length scale. So you can make your Gaussians very sharp with a long length, a short length scale, or very broad with a big length scale. And what we see on the right-hand side is a Gaussian process, or a stochastic process, who has this kernel as covariance function. 
And then you can draw functions from, it's like a random variable where you can draw functions from, and these functions are governed by this kernel function in this case. And for this exponential kernel, I, I didn't explain this properly because of time, right? But this is what it is roughly. And uh, so these three functions on the right-hand side are three random functions drawn from a Gaussian process, which has this kernel as covariance function. And that means basically that you can use this Gaussian kernel to model smooth functions. Right? If you have non-smooth functions like jagged functions, the Gaussian kernel is not such a great choice because it naturally is very smooth. Okay, so I think my question was slightly different. So now imagine you have these X and Z and they are fairly low dimensional. And in low dimensions, closeness of two vectors makes sense, right? If the vectors X and Z, for example, are very, very high dimensional, for example, the many body tensor representation of a molecule, right? It can very quickly uh, go into higher dimensions. And in high dimensions, like if we imagine almost every vector is equally distant from every other vector. So do you have any idea of when do these models break apart? Or like, how, how would you know when would this model break apart? Okay, let's see from the top of my head if I can say something. So on this, to this, um, so usually these original input space where the X and Z come from will be maybe not that high dimensional, right? But let's assume it is. Um, and then you're right, if I, if I remember correctly, I mean, if your high dimensional vector, if the components are random, then basically they all lie on a sphere or something and you have, yeah, yeah they are all kind of the same. But, <sighs> I mean, practically there will still be signal, right? So it's like, imagine you have two strong input feature signals that are relevant for your Y, and then you have like random additional components. I mean, your, your learning will degrade maybe the more random components you add or your signal will be weaker in some sense, um, but, but it will still be there, right? So I think it will still work. Maybe it will gradually degrade. I'm not 100% sure, but that is, um, how, yeah, how would right now think this would go. So yes, even if you have high dimensional input vectors, um, the, the distances between them are not comp exactly the same, right? There will still be some signal left. And if the components are, maybe many of the components will be zero. And if that is the case, then it's like a low dimensional vector, right? So I think in practice, it's not that much of a problem. But you could, you could I don't know, maybe think of cosine distance or something like this, but I think it's, usually not necessary. So I think since we are a bit progressed in time, it's a good time to stop now. If you do have questions still, um, I think Matthias would be happy to answer them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So you can ask. Sure, them. and you can also write me an email if you want, for example. No so let's uh, thank Matthias again, and then we conclude for today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for today, we are over. We meet tomorrow at nine here. So try to be here at 10 to nine. And also important, remember to sign out. Sign on the paper. We need that. Thanks.